Okay, it's uh, about two o'clock now, so I'll get started. Uh, welcome to Archer's online MPI course. Um, we're just going to start with a sort of quick 10 minute uh, overview of these courses and just introduction to what we'll be doing. Okay, uh, these talks are available and licensed, and you can use them if you wish as part of this license. There you go, exciting. Uh, so, what is Archer? Archer is a UK, UK national supercomputer service. Um, managed by EPSERC, the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with. <coughs> uh, but it's actually housed up here in Edinburgh uh, on the edge of the town, uh, supported by EPCC. Uh, the machine itself is a Cray XC, let me get this right, I want to say 30. Hopefully that's correct. If not, I have no doubt my colleagues from Cray will be cool. Um, You're me know. correct. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you, Claire, for confirmation that is the right one. Um, so it's supplied by Cray. Uh, and we, as part of the, the contract to run Archer, provide training and computational science and engineering support. Um, you're probably already aware of this as you are on this course. Um, these are always free to all academics. Um, so as I said, Archer is actually housed out on the edge of town at uh, the Advanced Computing Facility. Um, so this is a nice picture of the side of it. I'm told, I've not actually been to visit yet, but I'm told that that, that lovely panel that's well decorated is up against the wall, so you can't really see it very well. But uh, here's a good picture of it. Um, and what is EPCC? Uh, well, we're a UK National Supercomputing Centre, possibly the UK National Supercomputing Centre. Um, there are a few other places, but it tends to be things like the Met Office. You have their supercomputers for very specific purposes. I won't allow just anyone to, to apply for research grant time on it. Um, we were founded in 1990. Uh, it's a self-funding centre at the University of Edinburgh. It used to be an institute. We've moved up a layer of bureaucracy, which is nice for us. Uh, we're now a centre within the College of Science and Engineering. Um, and we don't receive any direct funding or very little from the university itself, uh, but instead fund ourselves through um, commercial and research contracts. Uh, we've been running national parallel systems for a very long time, since 94. Um, around 90 full-time staff, and we are growing currently. Um, for example, I started uh, about a year ago, actually, uh, on March, or in March. Um, we do a range of academic research and commercial projects, and we offer a one-year postgraduate master's in HPC, uh, also HPC with data science, and we do run a few other uh, courses or are involved in a few other courses as well. Um, do get in contact if you're interested in collaborating. Uh, many of our staff are named RAs on research grants. Um, we do put together joint research proposals, and we are involved in a number of European consortia, um, which I'll be talking about more a little bit later as well. Um, the key resources, so again, some of this you're probably already familiar with since you are here, but you can find all the material uh, for these courses on our website, um, including as well links to YouTube videos, which will cover the same lectures as the ones I'll be giving today. And I believe this is being recorded also, but I know it is. Um, so you can always come back and, and check things if you wish uh, and find our slides. Uh, who am I? Who's this voice? I don't know who I'm speaking to you. My name's Oliver. Uh, I'm an applications developer at EPCC. Um, currently working on two main projects, uh, that being Epigram HS, which is a big European consortia. Uh, there we're looking at programming models for uh, exascale heterogeneous systems, so very large Computers with things like GPUs and FPGAs strapped into them. Uh, and Highlands, which is high level meta scale modeling system, that's the one <coughs> got there in the end. Um, and that is looking at making it easier to write uh, Mathis Boltzmann codes, which is a particular type of computational fluid dynamics. Um, we're trying to make that slightly easier for the, the developers to develop uh, models by creating a domain-specific language for them. So that's the two main things I'm on. I was also previously on Intertwine, which is another um, exascale programming model uh, European research project. Uh, as well as that, I do teaching. I'm here right now doing this, uh, but I also teach on some of our MSc courses. Uh, a personal tutor on our data science, technology, and innovation program, which is actually a, a college-run uh, online learning course. Uh, I also am an RJ help desk operator, so if you are in the future or have ever um, had a problem with Archer and you, you've emailed in, or one of our other machines, in fact, and you've emailed in, there's a chance that this has come to me. 
to uh, to redirect to someone who knows how to help. <laughs> uh, and I'm also an auditor, which is very exciting, as you can imagine. Um, so other resources, please fill in our feedback forms. Uh, that's a great way of a finding out if we're doing something badly. We'd rather know that and do something to fix it. And b also if we're doing things well, let's us prove that to our funders here, the research councils. They like to hear that we're not just wasting all their time and money. So please do fill in our feedback forms. Uh, as I mentioned before, I'm a help desk operator, and you can always ask the help desk questions by emailing support at our base in the UK. Um, and as also previously mentioned, we run an NFC and HPC, and in HPC with data science, um, scholarships are available. So it may be of interest to you, or it may be of interest to your students, or it may be of interest to people you know. Um, taught by APC staff, uh, plus there's options in other departments. Um, fairly standard setup for an MSc in terms of how it's run. We also run some online accredited courses, including practical introduction to data science and practical introduction to HPC. Uh, both of those are actually also in that data science technology and innovation program I mentioned. Um, so during the course, uh, you will, well, you've been given, and hopefully you've received email about the fact that you've got access to Cirrus, which is another one of our machines. Uh, it's a bit more uh, easy to use, especially for this course, than, than Archer itself. Um, you'll have guest accounts for the duration of the course. I uh, please only use these for things we ask you to do, don't just um, decide you want to start mining Bitcoin. We will notice and we will stop it. <laughs> um, uh, these accounts will be closed immediately after the course. So make sure if you do want a copy of anything you've done during the course that you, you copy it off before the end. Uh, and all these materials will be available from the web page um, until uh, whenever. Uh, for longer term access to Cirrus, um, there's several ways, both for industry and academia. Uh, they will require justification of resources um, in the form of a technical assessment, which you submit to us, and then we'll let you know whether it's a good. Basically, that just says or asks you what it is you want to do with Cirrus, and we let you know whether or not Cirrus is a good fit. We may recommend a different machine if we feel it's not, um, but you can find more information about that on Cirrus's website. Uh, and the process is similar for Archer. Um, there's various different grants you can apply for. Okay, uh, and that takes me to the end of our well, welcome uh, slides. So now we'll get started on message passing concepts, um, which is the first proper lecture, as it were, of our course. Uh, so we're going to start off by talking not about MPI itself, but about the programming model on which it relies. Um, which will hopefully make. Oops. <laughs> can't see that. Go away. There we go. Uh, which will hopefully make uh, the explanation of the actual interface make a bit more sense later on. Um, so message passing programming. So we're going to cover the message passing model, uh, SPMD, which is a single program, multiple data. Uh, communication modes and collective communications. Uh, beginning with programming model, so programming model itself is um, sort of the, the conceptual view that a, a developer has on the tools that they're using um, to solve a particular problem. So, for example, in, in serial programming, we have fairly high level concepts like uh, arrays, uh, subroutines, and variables. Things you can make use of, um, but they're independent because they're just ideas about how you should structure a program. They're independent from the actual languages. And those languages, uh, the standards that define them are also independent from the actual implementation of those languages. So for example, for C, it will depend on your compiler's interpretation of the C code that you've written um, because the, the compiler translates between your human readable C code, hopefully human readable, uh, if you've done a nice job of it, um, to something that the computer itself can understand. Um, and same for Fortran and any other compiled language. Uh, and equally, interpreted languages have interpreters that do the same job, um, more or less. So, and all these things are, are separate. Uh, in message passing, in this parallel program model that we're going to be discussing, uh, the concepts are things like processes. Uh, sends and receives, collectives, single program, multiple data, and groups. And these are independent ideas about how programming can be done 
from the libraries themselves, um, which are MPI libraries in this case. Uh, and these are, or rather, the MPI standard defines the library interface. Um, and then that library and that interface is implemented by several different uh, vendors. So, for example, there's Open MPI, which is an open source effort to implement MPI that's very commonly used. Um, there's an Intel version of MPI. There's MPitch, which is a funded effort from a US national lab. Uh, there's also a Cray version, which they provide with their machines. And there's an IBM version, there's a HPE version. There are lots of different implementations of MPI, but they should all follow the standards set down um, for the library interface. So you should be able to program the same MPI code and use any of these implementations. But what actually happens after your MPI call um, under the hood is dependent on the implementation. Um, okay, and MPI is just one library that uh, sets out ways of using the concepts to find that a message parallel program, a message passing parallel program model. Uh, as I said before, it's based on the notion of processes. A process is you can think of it as a running program together with the data. Um, so processes are isolated from one another. They see their own memory area and not any other processes memory area. Um, so in this message passing model, you achieve parallelism by having these processes cooperating on the same task. Uh, and they can communicate with one another to achieve that by sending and receiving messages, but not by any other method. So for those of you who are familiar with OpenMP, OpenMP, you have a shared memory model where everybody can see the same memory area and access it all at the same time if they need to. Well, different parts of the same memory area at the same time. Um, in, in MPI, we don't have that, or in message passing, we don't have that. Every process is completely separate and sees only its own data. Um, it's a bit like the same, all variables are private in OpenMP. Um, OK. Again, the MPI standard is such that uh, to the applications developer, um, these sending and receiving their messages just look like library calls. Um, okay. So, okay, here we look at a, a sequential paradigm. And okay, this is just reiterating the point that we've already made about the process being some processor and some memory area unique to itself. Uh, so, in this parallel paradigm, there's this message passing interface uh, to some sort of communication network that allows the sending and receiving of messages between processes. Uh, and a message is just any any item of data. Um, so it could be an integer, it could be a string. Um, it can take on any form, but it's the only way to share data between processes. Uh, this, this type of model, this programming model works or is primarily used on distributed memory architectures. So here we have a photo of Hector, who is the predecessor to Archer, um, and what looks like a, an older Cray machine, actually, although I couldn't tell you which. Um, so on a machine like uh, Archer or Hector, you have many, 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 many nodes, uh, which are distributed um, around the room, in fact. Uh, and they're all connected together by some sort of interconnect, uh, which is quite fast. Archer has a, an Aries, a Cray Aries interconnect. Um, for example, uh, and these allow the rapid passing of messages between different nodes. Um, and the advantage of this type of approach is that it lets you split up a large problem uh, across many different nodes with separate memory areas, which may allow you to, to solve a problem that simply wouldn't fit on a single node, um, given the available memory, for example. But this sort of distributed machine which is what we would normally think of as a supercomputer, as opposed to um, many independent workstations, which is what you'd have without an interconnect. Um, so the process communicates. So say process one defines some variable A equals 23. Uh, it can choose to send to process two its value of A. OK, so it does that. Um, process two receives that message but receives it into a different buffer so the fact that it was called a on process one makes absolutely no difference to process two process two just gets some stream of bytes which interprets 
um, or it's which it assigns to the variable b. Okay, and then it puts that into its own memory area. Uh, so it can set its own variable a equals b plus one. Okay, and that has no impact on what's happened on process one. These are two different values of a. Uh, so most message passing programs use a single program multiple data model uh, in which every process runs their own copy of the same program and single program but they have their own unique data um, now you might be thinking if they're all running the same program how do they do anything useful or interesting uh, the answer is that you can branch that program based on a unique identifier for each process so you can, for example, say if you are zero process, process zero, and do this. If you're any other process, do something else entirely. Um, and this is how we get them to run different things while running the same code fundamentally. Um, that might seem like an odd way to do it, but it actually simplifies a lot of things. Um, for example, you don't have to compile 100 different binaries to run a program on 100 processes. Uh, you can just compile one and they all run it, but it's forked internally um, based on the process ID. Uh, typically, we would run one process per processor slash core. Um, you don't have to, so you can you can easily run uh, four processes, say, on a dual core laptop. Uh, it will be slower than if you were just running two in all likelihood, um, but you can do it. It's mainly useful for testing if you're doing something that is important, you would probably just stick to one process per core and it's the most efficient approach, generally speaking. Um, yeah. All right, so here we have a sort of um, C-like pseudocode for some sort of message passing program. Uh, and as you can see, it's branched based on the controller process ID, uh, or oh, sorry, on the process ID. So there's one controller process which we normally choose as process zero, for example, and then everything else does a different thing entirely. And it's a way we get our processes to cooperate. Um, and the same sort of pseudocode uh, in a Fortran-like style. Um, so hopefully that makes sense to you all. Uh, so messages, this is obviously the kind of key important aspect uh, of a message passing program. Uh, what exactly the messaging is doing. So a message transfer is a number of data items of a certain type from the memory of one process to the memory of another process. Um, now, it's not quite as clean as that. A message will typically contain things like the ID of the sending processor, the ID of the receiving processor. Uh, the type of the data items, uh, it needs that because as I mentioned, the receive buffer is completely independent from whatever buffer the data was sent from, so whatever the variable name. Um, so to interpret the data correctly, your receiving process needs to be told what type it is. Um, so we also need a number of data items, uh, the data itself, and usually some sort of identifier for the message and some other bookkeeping stuff ends up in there. Um, so there is always a certain amount of overhead in, in messages um, for practical reasons. Uh, there are different modes of communication available. Um, so your sending can be either synchronous or asynchronous. Um, so synchronous send simply is not completed until the message has been received. Um, so it blocks the sending process uh, until that receipt has been confirmed. Whereas an asynchronous send can be sent and then the sending process is free to go about its day and it doesn't need to worry about whether or not and when that data has been received. Um, received are usually synchronous. There's nothing you could write a message passing uh, library that did not need that. Um, it would make things more complicated. Typically, you would just do a synchronous receive. Um, so essentially, you generally send things, or rather, you generally receive things immediately before they're needed. Um, there are there are asynchronous receives available, but they're less commonly used. It tends to be the sending process uh, moves on, but then receipt is synchronized. Um, but 
with fairly advanced usage. So um, <laughs> I think in a sense, uh, the analogy here is with faxing a letter. Now, I'll be honest with you, I have never seen a fax machine um, in the flesh, so to speak. <laughs> um, but I gather from this slide, from context, that when you send a fax, um, you have to wait until the whole thing has been received before, and it will confirm to you that that has happened. Um, so you know when the letter has started to be received. It will give you some signal to say that that has happened. Um, whereas an asynchronous send is more like posting a letter, where you simply chuck it in the post box, and then you assume at some point a postman will arrive, pick it up, and then it will eventually be delivered to the recipient, but you don't know when exactly that's happened, uh, and you may indeed not care. You, your job ends as soon as it's sent, and you carry on about your day. Um, so then the next sort of obvious mode of communication is, is simply point to point. Um, so, so far, we've considered only two processes, one sender and one receiver. Um, and this is point to point communication. Uh, I hope it's fairly clear when that's the case. Um, this is the simplest form of message passing, and it relies on a matching send and receive. So that's uh, quite key, actually, is that for every send, you must have a receive uh, elsewhere in your code. We'll come back to that in a bit, I believe. Um, and this analogy is sending personal emails. So this is simply for one person to another, as opposed to, example, for example, mailing a mailing list where many people would receive in point to point is simply one send, one receive, and a single link in between. Uh, on the other hand, collective communications are available. Uh, so while a simple message communicates only between two processes, uh, there's often times when in your program you may need to communicate between a whole group of processes and collective communications achieve this. Now, the underlying implementations can be built from point-to-point -point communications. Um, and indeed, when collective communications were first proposed and introduced to the standard, they often were, because it was the simplest way to create a working implementation to begin with. And times have moved on since then. And now I would be very surprised if that were the case. I would expect them to be implemented in a different way that was more efficient. Um, simply because there's, there's some routing things you can do that are better for these types of communications. Um, but also there's certain types of bookkeeping that are not required in this situation. So there are ways to, to optimize collective communications compared to doing a simple point to point. Um, and I would expect them to be used in any uh, up-to-date MPI library. Um, but this is, this is closer in terms of the programming model uh, to sending an email to a mailing list where you expect everybody on that list to receive that single communication. So a type of um, collective communication, ah, well, no, I'll take that back. So one way of synchronizing your code is a barrier. A barrier is probably the most sort of hardcore brute force way to do it. Um, it's a global synchronization, it takes every single process and says, OK, you're not allowed to pass this point in the code. And remember that all these processes are running exactly the same binary. They're running the same code. So they'll get to this barrier, and they have to wait there until every other process is also in that barrier. And then they will proceed. Um, so it is a global synchronization point in your code. Uh, there are reasons to do this. Um, one good one, for example, is if you're doing some sort of profiling uh, and you need to time a particular section, um, you might well want to put a barrier uh, at either side of that in order to make sure that um, you can see how quickly every process gets through it. Um, if you want to time just that particular section of the code. Um, but in general, it's best not to try and fill your code with too many barriers because um, chances are you don't always need them. Um, and you will have a lot of processes just sort of sitting and waiting for a while um, for the slowest one to reach that same point. Um, OK, so I'll go back to what I was starting to say that this is a type of, of collective communication in that every process is involved in it. 
Uh, so another type of electric communication is a broadcast. Um, and here, uh, that's exactly what, what you might expect, is a one-to-all communication. So one of sends its data to every other process in the group um, with the end result that everybody or every process has that same piece of data. Um, although again, they can all receive into whatever variable or buffer they like. So they may not be using the same uh, variable name for that data. They will have a copy of that same data. And here we have an example for you. So here process eight is broadcasting to every other process. Oh, sorry, not process eight. A process is broadcasting the number eight to every other process. Uh, another type is scattering. So in scattering, instead what you do is you take some array, for example, uh, and you divide it up across all of the processes in a group. Um, so everybody has a different part of that array. So for example, here, um, so you can see each process has been assigned a different variable or a different part of the array, sorry. Um, and what's important to note about this is uh, the root process so the one that's actually got that whole array itself, A has to define a separate buffer to receive um, its individual part of that array into. So the, the number two is separate. Uh, and B, that the order is in no way guaranteed and does not relate um, to the ranking of the processes or the IDs of the processes. Um, there's no guarantee about where each part of the array will go. You just know that it will be evenly divided amongst your processes. Uh, so gathering is, is the inverse process um, where you know that your entire group of processes has individual bits of data and you want to collect them all into one process. Um, okay, so they will send to some root process here. And you can reconstruct your original array that we previously brought uh, scattered. Um, Yes. So again, it, the important point to note here is you need to make sure um, that whatever, that the array that your root process is going to receive into is big enough to fit everybody's data in, or you will run into problems. Um, so there's also reduction operations um, where you combine data again from several processes to form a single result. But here, instead of simply gathering them into some buffer or some array, uh, we're actually going to combine those numbers in some way. For example, it could be a simple summation. Um, <laughs> that would be the case in this example, which is a strike part. <laughs> this and Gerardo did not write these slides. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the example here is a strike part. So you could have for every um, yes result, one, for every no result, a zero. And then you perform a summation to find out whether enough people have voted for it. Here yeah, they have not. Um, but it doesn't have to be a summation. Uh, it could be any kind of reduction operator. Um, for example, you could be multiplying them all together. You could simply be trying to find the maximum value. Um, so it, we'll discuss this more once we're on to looking at actual MPI. Um, but for now, the concept is simply that you can, uh, or simply that you can combine data from across your uh, process group uh, into a single variable if you if you need to. And it's a common operation um, for many types of application. Okay. So launching a message passing program. Uh, as we've said a few times already, um, it runs from a single piece of source code, so a single compiled binary. Uh, with calls to message passing functions. Um, and this is all compiled with a standard compiler and it links. So there are, you wouldn't necessarily call what you, your standard compiler uh, name to compile MPI code um, because often uh, the message passing vendors will provide you with a wrapper to a standard compiler uh, that includes linking to uh, the MPI libraries for you, so you don't have to do that step yourself. Um, 
So it won't necessarily, you won't just be calling GCC yourself, but underneath it is just using, for example, GCC or the Intel compilers or whatever. Um, so the, the actual uh, compilation step is, is not really any different um, from compiling serial code. Um, and your single piece of source code looks just like your source code normally would in that language, except there are calls to this MPI library. Um, and you have to include the MPI library or message passing library, I should still be saying at this point. Uh, okay, you then run multiple copies of that same executable on your parallel machine. Um, and each copy is a separate process. Uh, the way that you do that is through a launcher program, which basically just says to the, to the operating system, uh, I've got this, this executable, please run it 100 times uh, all at once. Okay, and each process has its own completely private memory area. Um, and they can, and it's important to, to understand the conceptual as well, is that they can be at different points in that program, uh, unless you've explicitly included some kind of synchronization, such as a barrier, uh, the chances are that they will be at different points in the program. Um, so you can never rely on them being at precisely the same point at the same time, um, because the timing is down to individual machines and network speeds and all these kind of things, um, which are not typically the same across a large computer or even a small one. And of course, your code is most likely branching based on processor ID. So the coverage will be different across different processes as well. Okay, but you have some kind of launcher that sets off those processes for you. Um, and some, some common issues with message passing models. Uh, okay, your sends and receives must match. Um, for those of you familiar with, which I guess is all of you, in fact, from our, our poll earlier, um, for those of you familiar with uh, languages which require explicit memory allocation and deallocation, this is exactly the same way that you must always have some sort of tree for every malloc. Uh, in C, um, you must always have a, a receive for every send. If you don't, if you have a, a send, well, if it's a synchronous send, certainly, <laughs> and there's no matching receive, then your code will just deadlock. Um, and it will be waiting forever for that receive to happen. Um, if it's asynchronous, it's a bit more complicated. Uh, it's basically, what will most likely happen is that something will go wrong further down the line. Um, if you if you have mismatches in your sends and receives, um, and if you don't, that's sort of through, or if it doesn't go wrong further down the line, that's entirely through luck and should not be relied upon. Um, so there must always be a receive for every send, uh, and vice versa. So if you start adding extra receives, you'll also run into issues um, because again, they're blocking. Um, it is possible to write extremely complicated programs, but actually a lot of scientific codes in particular have fairly simple communication patterns and also uh, have a, a small set of, of communication patterns across all of them. That um, It's certainly nice from a research perspective, for example, because it gives you a list of common communication patterns to, to try and improve in order to um, improve a wide range of scientific codes. But in general, um, it's best, it's, it's better generally, if you can, to have a simple communication structure, especially to begin with. So it might be for some reason, it needs to be more complicated later on, but it's best to start simple. Um, and yes, the scientific goals in particular tend to do things like domain decompositions, where basically you'll have some grid, it gets divvied up across processes, uh, and at the end of each time step, those processes need to communicate um, the boundary conditions for their particular parts of the grid. And it's called a halo swap. Um, and it's extremely common across many scientific codes because they use this um, domain decomposition structure internally. Um, always use communications if you can. There's no point re-implementing your own point-to-point -point version of what should just be a collective communication. Um, for the simple reason that, at the very worst, the underlying library will have implemented that collective communication using 
point to point, um, but it'll still have done it in a single line. Well, what for you as the application developer could have been a single line of code versus your multiple lines in order to perform the same thing. Um, and it's very likely that the, the library developer has actually implemented it in a much more efficient way than the simple point to point. Um, so don't, don't be afraid of using collective communications. They did have a sort of bad reputation um, when they first arrived for the reason that they were quite often um, simply implemented on top of point to point communications. Um, but these days that's very much not the case. Um, so if, if what you need to do is a collective communication, just use the collective um, communication function. Okay, uh, and then to summarize, messages is the only form of communication. Um, our processes are completely siloed from one another. They have no way of sharing data or doing anything other than these messages. Uh, most systems use this SPMD model uh, where all processes run the same code. There's a lot of reasons for that, um, especially from a practical perspective. It's a lot easier to implement. Uh, it's a lot easier to write code in that model um, because you only have to have one source file. Uh, and yes, every process has a unique identifier that allows it to fork uh, or to take a different branch from the same code. Um, the basic communication form is point to point, uh, but you also get collective communications uh, that implement more complicated patterns that often occur in many codes. Um, and also things like barriers and synchronizations as well, when those are necessary. Um, so message passing is a programming model, and that model is implemented by MPI, which is the message passing interface. Uh, I forgot to say that earlier. Um, the message passing interface is a library of function subroutine calls. In fact, MPI is a standard that lays out um, the API or the interface for uh, MPI, but it doesn't say, and it says what each function should do, um, but it doesn't say how it should do it. That's up to the individual library developers, which are several. Um, but it's sort of essential to understand these, these basic concepts. Um, that all variables in each process are private and that communications uh, are always explicit. So there's no there's no messaging between processes that you don't, as a developer, see and don't explicitly say should happen. And there's no sort of hidden shared state between processes. Um, they're entirely reliant on you saying, okay, talk to processor three now. Um, and they all run the same binary. Um, So if you understand this sort of model, then the chances are um, it will be easy to understand MPI itself uh, because it simply implements these ideas. Um, so it's actually a very different model to sequential programming and then gives a little example. Um, so this, this little code excerpt here uh, would not really work as you might expect. Uh, in a message passing model for the simple reason that X uh, is likely to be different on every process. Um, and if, so if X happens to be less than zero on a single process, that process will, will exit, um, but the others will keep going and they will not know and they will not expect that another process has gone down. Uh, and this will ultimately cause you problems. Your, your code will eventually fail or abort with an MPI error. Um, which, I mean, is sort of what you want, but it's not really the way you want that to happen. Um, so you could only make something like this work if you, A, use some sort of communication to tell all the other processes that something bad has happened, um, and B, you would have to make sure that X was defined on every process and had a value that hopefully would be greater than zero on every process. Um, Okay, so it's, it's getting your head around that fact. If you can do that, then you'll be very happy with the rest of this course. Um, first of all, I'll ask, does anyone have any questions? Um, and I realize I should have said this in my, in my uh, welcome uh, presentation. 
Um, if you do have any questions, feel free to ask them on the on the Blackboard chat. Uh, as I said, you have that open on a separate computer from the one I'm presenting on. Um, so if you do have any questions, just let us know in there. Uh, if you, if you might find it. Best way to ask questions is either to type it into the chat. If you're not familiar with Blackboard, if you go to the bottom right hand corner of your screen and click the pink arrow and then click on the speech bubble, you'll see the chat area. Um, or if you want to raise your hand, if you want to interrupt with a question, then Oliver will see that and he'll be able to pause and address any questions as we go along. If you want to ask using your mic, you can try. Uh, sometimes that works. Sometimes people have problems. So um, whatever works for you. Thank you very much, Claire. Okay, Claire, for uh, pointing out and letting people know how they can ask us questions. Um, Looking like everyone might be okay though. Uh, in which case, I would propose that we break now and then come back. It's just we come back at, at 3 30. Um, and to answer your question, Roberto S., so uh, Roberto S. is asking in the Blackboard chat um, if it's possible to call MPI from Python or R. Uh, Python, the answer is yes. I believe there is a, a PyMPI um, well, package available. MPI, MPI for Py, I think. Ah, MPI for Py. <laughs> there we go. Um, thank you, Claire. Um, it, I believe as well, is quite quite advanced these days and, and does work quite well. Um, when I first started using MPI, I think it was uh, people didn't really rate it that much, but it's doing much better now. Uh, we won't be showing those APIs specifically, um, but they are similar in, in many ways to the stand, to the MPI standard. Um, uh, so the concepts will all be the same. Uh, I think also there is an issue with running that on something like Archer. I think it's not possible currently on Sirius. It might be different. Um, I have to defer to authority on that one, slash I can check in a break for you. Uh, R is a different story. I believe R has its own um, way of doing parallel things, although someone with uh, more experience with R might be able to tell you difference. Uh, but I think R does not use MPI as its underlying model, although I don't know for sure. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, great. You're welcome. Uh, I see some more people are typing. Oh, Martin says it is possible to run Python on Archer. <laughs> You'll need help from the Archer help desk to set it all up. Um, thank you, Claire, for um, posting a link to MPI for Pi as well. Uh, thank you, Marta. Uh, okay, so I'm guessing from what Marta's saying as well, you need to, uh, in the very least, install it yourself in a sort of mini conda. Um, okay, that's good. Oh, and Rory points out that R does have a wrapper for MPI. Um, and we haven't used it personally. I also have not. Uh, I have to admit, I've used R only very little. Um, but for both Python and R, the chances are that the API is very similar, if not exactly the same, um, as those used for C, for example. There might be differences in how it handles uh, typing that might be hidden from you, uh, particularly in Python, which doesn't really have the concept of strict typing. Um, but underneath it will be doing the same thing. I suspect the sort of bindings to the C code as well um, in reality. OK, so Nico asks uh, a good question. Uh, so in the gather operation, how can you ensure that a particular process would place the data exactly where you want to in the master process? Uh, put simply, uh, Nico, you, you tell it. <laughs> So you say, let's see. Yeah, um, so every process here has to run. So that's one thing I, I perhaps we just said about the collective communications, although it'll come up again when we actually look at them um, in the library itself. Um, they all rely on you providing on the root process uh, the buffer where you want to put those things. Um, and this is achieved because when you're calling a collective communication, 
every single process has to call that collective communication. So say you want to do a broadcast, that's not just a case of calling broadcast from your root process and then the others will receive that message. They all have to call uh, broadcast as well and they get told whether or not they're the root process so they know whether to do a send or a receive. Um, and for the gather collective, uh, there will be an into that function call or to that library call that says, this is the, the buffer, uh, the memory address I want to put the data that's gathered into. And that's here how you ensure where it goes, um, which is nice and simple as long as you remember it <laughs> and remember the order of the arguments. Welcome. Okay, well, thank you everyone for the questions. Uh, it's good to to be able to get through those as well. I'm now actually quite glad that we finished a little bit early. Um, but it seems like that's it for now, in which case I propose we finish up for the time being and return at half three. I will be going to get the coffee. Um, thank you, everyone, and see you at half three. It's half three. Welcome back. Hopefully, you all have a good break. Uh, so next, we're going to be talking about NPI itself, uh, as opposed to message passing, programming, the programming model. Um, so on that note, I thought I'd quickly actually bring us back to this, this slide from the previous talk, though. Um, so there is a bit of blurring lines even in this first one, which is meant to be a message passing programming concept between that and MPI itself. Uh, and there is a reason for that. Um, so whereas in serial programming, there are many different languages that, that implement essentially the same concepts uh, from serial programming. Um, not all of them, but many of them have very similar ideas about variables, arrays, uh, objects, um, all these kind of things. Uh, in message passing programming, um, there's not just MPI. There are other message passing programming libraries. Um, but MPI is by far the most widely used one. Uh, it's, a, it's one of the situations where essentially it's dominated, um, which is actually quite convenient uh, in many ways because it means that you know you only have to think about learning one message passing programming library. Although it is not not the only one these days, there are there are other options available, um, and indeed there's things like tasking frameworks which utilize message passing uh, concepts, um, although many of them may, in fact, use MPI underneath. Um, but that's why we're, we're focusing so much on, on MPI here, and um, the actual library itself is what we're going to look at next. So this is introduction to MPI. Okay, so what is it? <laughs> it's a message passing programming library. Uh, jobs are good. No, so the uh, the MPI forum um, is a body which governs MPI essentially. Uh, MPI itself is a standard um, defined by the int or the document produced by the MPI forum. The first one uh, was produced in '93. Um, the forum itself uh, consists of 60 people from 40 different organizations, uh, including EPCC, I should say. Um, uh, users and vendors are represented from across the world. Uh, and it's a two-year process of proposals, meetings, and review. So the, the MPI standard is quite carefully curated, um, always with an eye to ensuring um, performance is never uh, regressed. And uh, the new ideas and new things introduced into the standard are sensible. Um, so they don't want to introduce a whole lot of functions that no one will ever use. Uh, they try to focus on things which are useful, uh, which goes back to this point earlier about many scientific codes, for example, having very similar communication patterns. Uh, that's quite a handy thing from the MPI forum's point of view because uh, it lets them focus on certain areas where they can you know, achieve the most benefit simply by improving particular um, capabilities of MPI. Um, so MPI, you said, is a library 
of function calls. It's not a language. Um, the three main languages we'll look at today for, in fact, two in reality uh, languages we'll be looking at um, for calling MPI libraries are C and Fortran. But as we noted in discussion earlier, uh, there's a Python interface which is quite mature now and works well, um, and in our interface. So other languages do support um, calling MPI libraries, um, but it's a library of language. There's no such thing as an MPI compiler. However, just to confuse you, um, most vendors provide a wrapper for your compiler, um, whatever it may be, that links the MPI library for you, simply to avoid you having to personally um, provide those link op uh, options to your compiler. So it simplifies things. So you will call something like MPICC or MPIF90, but that is not actually a compiler itself. It is probably calling uh, GCC or G4Tran underneath. Um, for example, um, and the compiler doesn't know or care about the fact that there's MPI there. It just looks like any other library that you might link um, to, your, to your executable at compile time. Um, and MPI handles interface to things like um, hardware. For example, if you have uh, a Cray Aries interconnect on your supercomputer, um, the implementation deals with connecting up uh, whatever message you're trying to send to that interconnect um, and delivering it at the other end. So those are all implementation details that don't make a difference to the top level API that you, the application developer, uh, will call. The, the goals and scope of MPI, um, as I mentioned before, they're very focused on um, performance and efficiency, uh, but also portability. So ideally, uh, it shouldn't matter what machine uh, your trying to compile your MPI on. In reality, of course, it does. It matters <laughs> quite a lot. But uh, it, it's the implementation that bears the brunt of that. So, um, or the, the, the implementer, I should say. So whoever is writing the MPI library that you will be calling um, has to make a lot of changes based on the hardware. But you, the applications developer, don't have to make any changes to your source code. It just calls the top level API, and it should just work. Uh, and the, aim, the idea there is to, to allow for efficient implementation by um, separating concerns between the actual implementation and uh, the goal of the application developer. So the application developer says, I would like to send this message. And the library implementer deals with how to do that best on a particular type of hardware. Um, and so it also offers a great deal of functionality, including support for heterogeneous parallel architectures. Uh, although again, that's largely intention dependent. How well that may or may not actually work. Um, uh, so I should say as well, what it means by heterogeneous here um, is, for example, your computers or your nodes do not have to be the same uh, same type of computer at all. Um, it does not mean heterogeneous in the sense of GPUs and FPGAs and things like that just yet. So there is sort of stuff on the horizon, including um, possibly some of the, the work of Epigram HS, for example. We'll be looking at things like um, how you could make use of MPI on a GPU, or to a GPU even. Um, but yeah, when it says heterogeneous parallel architectures, it, it means more like traditional computers, but different kinds. And um, MPI doesn't necessarily care about that. Um, so the header files. Um, so from our little uh, sort of survey earlier, um, the ones that are relevant here are Fortran 90 and CC++. Um, CC++ is a standard hash include uh, MPI.h. Um, C++ developers may note that that is a C header. Um, more on that later. Uh, yep, and it should be in a standard directory unless you've built your own and for some reason um, 
you can probably assume that you've installed it in some central location. Uh, Fortran 90, it's a use MPI declaration. Um, the function format is the same. Uh, so, so just in the, in the chat, Matthew has asked, can we offload work to a GPU whilst using MPI? Um, the answer is yes, but not using MPI uh, yet. So generally speaking, GPUs don't have their own rank um, in most MPI implementations. Um, but you can use standard sort of CUDA type things to push stuff off. Um, this is, I should say, well, this is in my experience. And as far as I understand, um, don't take that as gospel truth. Someone may know better than I, but as I understand it, no. Um, but there's nothing to stop you using um, standard CUDA. At the same time, uh, and then you're into the realm of hybrid parallel programming, um, which can come with its own set of, of uh, gotchas. Um, so the MPI function format uh, in C, this will return an error code, uh, which you can also ignore. Um, often will, unless you, have, you want to do explicit error handling. Um, and the format is all caps MPI underscore capital letter function name. Um, and then Fortran, it's just all caps. And um, the main difference really is that you have this IRA parameter at the end. Um, and that's because the MPI uh, or the Fortran MPI routines don't return any values, they're not functions, they are subroutines. Um, so you have to include an output variable for your error code, um, which is just some integer. Uh, and that's optional in F2008, but otherwise essential. So basically, just always include it. There's no reason not to. Um, MPI controls its own internal data structures. So in terms of C, that means it type gets its own structs and so on. Um, it gives you handles for those. Uh, all the Fortran handles are integers for Fortran reasons. Um, but they all have sort of standard names. Um, made things a little bit easier. Uh, so one very important thing is that you must always initialize MPI yourself. Now, it does not need to be the very first thing you call in your code. You can do any amount of setup and then call MPI in it. However, it does need to be the very first MPI procedure that is called. You cannot use any other MPI function before MPI has been initialized. Um, this is true across all languages. Uh, do note that multiple processes are already running before that MPI in is called. So, the call that we said before that your MPI job uh, is run by a process launcher. So you say to your launcher, I would like 100 MPI processes, please. Um, it's doing that from the beginning of your, your executable. OK, so before MPI in it's called, there's already 100 copies of your code running. So whatever variables you declare before that um, are still available after MPI in it is called. Uh, MPI in it does not itself sort of fork or executable and launch those processes as they're all already running, um, which is more convenient than it is inconvenient. Um, but any any data that you uh, declare before the MPI in it is still replicated across every process. Um, okay. So okay, here's a little little example. Um, so in C, there's two ways you can, well, one way put you in it, um, using MPI as far in it. Uh, however, you don't have to provide it with RC and RV. There's optional, we can just send null in instead. Uh, I quite often do, because I um, don't often actually write means that really require any <laughs> inputs from the command line. Um, however, you know, you can provide those. Actually, so what, what it does with those um, is implementation dependent. There's nothing in the standard that says, you know, if they provide these options, do this. Um, a particular MPI implementation may choose to do something with a certain type of 
input parameter. Um, may also not. So there's a good chance that doing MPI in it with argc and argv will do um, nothing different whatsoever than MPI in it null null. Um, for Fortran, uh, it's slightly simpler. It's just called MPI in it IRA. Uh, so I've ever need your IRA. And I note that there is a syntax <laughs> error on this slide because I error is all caps in the call and it should be lowercase. Um, so, you know, do you declare a variable before you decide to provide it um, to Fortran or to the MPI routine as a return variable? Um, so, the next concept I want to explore is communicators. Uh, now, before in the message passing programming, uh, oh. uh, see, so Alessandro is, is asking in the chat, why would we use an MPI in it then uh, if multiple codes are already running even before the call? Um, the answer is that it initializes all of the sort of sending and receiving um, infrastructure. So all the process launcher does is launches multiple copies of your code, but to actually do any communication, you do, do need to have initialized the rest of MPI. Um, so you could use a, an MPI launcher to uh, run 100 copies of identical code that didn't have any MPI inside them, and that would be fine, but they would all be doing exactly the same thing, and there would be no opportunity to um, branch that code based on process ID or do any communication between them. It would just be 100 copies of exactly the same executable uh, all running at once, um, which is a, you know, a fairly niche use case <laughs> if indeed it exists at all. So to do any sort of communication between those processes and to use any of the features of MPI, you do need to have initialized it. Um, under the hood, it does uh, a fair amount of stuff like set up the communication um, and links to the hardware and things like that. Um, yeah, there's a fair amount can go on under the hood when MPI is called. Um, uh, why doesn't the MPI launcher launch the initialization, the initialization itself? Um, is there an advantage in separating the two things? If they all called MPI, then would that make a difference for you? It's an interesting question. Um, I imagine there is some benefit. Largely, it's, it's expected. Okay, yeah. So, so Basil user points out that uh, you could provide different parameters, and. Um, that likely was a concern of the MPI forum, um, since they have this mode in the C uh, interface of these where you can provide input parameters. Um, as I said, most implementations don't really do anything with that, um, but they could. That option exists, and it exists because those things are separated. Um, so I think a large part of it is simply to ensure that those concerns are separated. Uh, there may be other technical reasons why it's important. Um, but that's a good question, Alessandro. OK. Um, so before, in the, in the kind of message passing programming lecture, I talked about uh, groups of processes quite abstractly. And um, in the MPI library, uh, it's more concretely, concretely defined as a communicator. Uh, and there is always at least one communicator available, the default communicator. The default communicator is MPI com world. Um, now, MPI com world, as you might expect, simply contains every single process that you have launched. Um, okay, you can create sub communicators from that, uh, but you cannot. You cannot generally create a communicator that is larger than world once your process, because you would require uh, a launcher to fire off extra processes. 
that's generally speaking not allowed. Um, so you've got your communicator that contains every single process, but how do you know which process you are? And um, so in C, there's a function MPI com rank, uh, which has two inputs, MPI com. So as we mentioned earlier, uh, MPI does a lot of type desk for you. MPI com is a type um, that is an MPI communicator. Um, and the second input is the address or pointed to an integer. Um, or an integer address, uh, and simply that is that is the integer that will be overwritten with your rank. Um, so it's like a Fortran style output variable, essentially. Um, hence, you need to provide its its reference, not uh, the the actual integer itself. Uh, meanwhile, in Fortran, uh, it's MPI com rank all caps. Uh, you need to provide a communicator. Uh, an output variable which is rank um, and IRA and all of them are integers. Okay, um, but again, in both languages, MPI defines MPI com world for you, and you can always provide that. That is just says you know use the communicator that contains every process which has been launched. Uh, the rank is not a physical process number. It has absolutely nothing to do with the underlying hardware. Um, there are things you can do that will mean that processes that are near each other in rank might be near each other on your actual machine, but it's, that's not uh, a library defined thing or a standard defined thing. Um, the ranks are essentially arbitrary, except that they always begin at zero uh, and go to n minus one, where n is the number of processes you've launched in MPI com world. Um, Obviously, if you're using a smaller communicator that you've created, that will have less ranks. Um, but it's numbered from zero. So process zero uh, is often treated as though it is special, although it's worth remembering that it is not. Um, but of course, if you have to have one special process, it is best to make it zero because you know that zero will always exist, no matter how many processes you're running on. So if you run on one process, process zero will exist. If you run on 100 processes, process zero will exist. Um, that isn't true of any other rank. And rank is the general term that is used in MPI for the uh, identifying number of a process. Okay, so here we have a slightly longer example again of uh, int rank being defined so in C style or in C. Um, MPI com rank is called using this MPI com world as input which MPI provides for you always, uh, giving the address of rank, and it will return that particular process's ID, um, and very similar story in Fortran, uh, except it's called MPI common rank, um, and you need to remember I error. Okay, so the other important question you might well have is how many processes are contained within a communicator? Uh, now you might think, well, I've launched 12 processes, so 12 should be easy, uh, and that's true. But there's not necessarily a way for your executable to know that <laughs> by itself, um, because the the launcher um, and the library itself are completely separate. Um, so what MPI does is it provides a function for you. The MPI com size simply returns the size of any given communicator. Um, so you can ask for MPI com world and it should return the number of processes that you launched. Uh, and as you can see, the format is, is fairly, um, is more or less what you'd expect MPI underscore com underscore size. You need to provide a communicator uh, and then again an integer to be or the address of an integer which will be overwritten with the answer. Um, and the theme is basically true for the Fortran. Okay, and the other important step, um, you've initialized MPI, you must also finalize it. Um, as with the initialized call, it does not need to be the very last thing that you call in your code. You're welcome to do other things afterwards. Um, uh, so 
That's all he's asking in the chat. Does MPI com size return the number of active processes or all subscribers? Um, it will return all of the total number of processes that were in a particular communicator, which I guess is what you're calling all subscribers. Um, so it will not necessarily be all of the processes that are launched. It will only be all of the processes that are launched if you provide MPI com world as the communicator. Uh, if one of them has failed, uh, then you're in trouble. Uh, it will still return the total number. Um, it won't. So MPI doesn't, in general, internally to itself, have any way to, to let you know that the process has died. Um, that's generally not an expected situation. Uh, your the launcher will generally notice that. Um, or you will have a situation where all of your processes except one has called MPI finalize and nothing's happened for a while. And at that point, um, your launcher may notice and kill the whole thing. Um, but it's not, uh, there's no, well, there are extensions to MPI that allow for resilience. Um, but in general, it's not there. So MPI com size is just the number in the communicator. Um, but good question, thank you. So yes, you must always finalize MPI. Uh, it doesn't have to be the last thing you called, but it does need to be the last MPI thing you call. Um, uh, Gany is just asked in the chat, can MPI be called more than once? Um, I assume he means, can it be initialized more than once? The answer is no. So you must have one initialize, one finalize within a single uh, program. You can't, so it's not like OpenMP, for example, where you might open multiple parallel regions through your code and close them. Uh, MPI must be initialized exactly once and finalized exactly once on every process. Um, so that's another important point. Uh, every MPI process must call that is launched uh, must call MPI init, not just one of them. So don't put uh, if rank equals zero MPI init, that will not work. Bad things will happen. Uh, and the same is true of MPI finalize. Um, every process needs to call us. They don't need to call it at the same time. Uh, so it's quite okay for your processes to go out of step, as long as they don't try and do anything with MPI after they've called M uh, MPI finalize or before they've called MPI init. Um, Uh, so everything needs to happen in between these two. Um, the uh, you're welcome. <laughs> uh, so the the syntax is, is again, I think what you would expect. Uh, MPI underscore finalize uh, returns an integer, which is just the error code in C. Um, but again, you don't need to actually assign that integer to anything you don't want to. Um, and Fortran's MPI finalize I error, and you do need the integer I error to be there, uh, except in Fortran 2008. But because it's only in Fortran 2008 that you can omit it, you might as well just have it there. Okay. Uh, so another thing that, that the MPI standard defines should be there um, is some way of checking what machine you're actually on. Uh, this can be useful. So the main way to identify an individual process um, is by rank. And that's what you will use 99% of the time. You might want to know if your ranks happen to be located or a set of ranks happen to be located on the same machine. Um, and MPI get processor name will allow you to do that. Um, how useful that actually is in practice is debatable. Um, but okay, yeah, it, it can be used as a debug feature to confirm that your mapping is something nice for your particular application. Um, but keep in mind that you may very well, and on Archer certainly will, <laughs> have multiple processes per individual um, machine, um, what it's calling processor name. The name is a bit misleading um, because MPI was defined, I recall, in the early 90s, <laughs> where it was a bit more likely that you might have a machine with a single processor on it. Um, that is almost certainly not the case these days. Uh, but you can do this with MPI get processor name. Um, yeah. 
Okay, and the important thing here is that you need to remember that uh, to provide it with an integer, which gives you the name and length. Ooh, Claire's done some digging. Thank you, Claire. Uh, so she's spoken to one of our other MPI gurus, and they point out um, that indeed you, there are scenarios where it can be useful to pass parameters to the MPI in it. Um, and okay, it would also mandate MPI allocating your memory at the beginning uh, rather than when it's actually used. Uh, so that's a good point. Um, okay, and it might restrict more advanced functionality. Thank you very much, Claire, for, for that. And thank you, Adrian Jackson, <laughs> for, for passing that on. Um, okay. And thank you again for the question, uh, Alessandro. Um, yes, processor name. <laughs> you need some kind of uh, character array in C and an integer, which is going to be the um, Oh, I see. Yeah, okay. Uh, which is a link, link for that name. Um, and then a similar call in Fortran, but as noted, that's sort of somewhat debatable usage. Um, it can be interesting as a debugging thing or to check that the mapping is something nice, um, but it's not a call that you would use very often. Um, so we've covered some basic MPI calls, uh, but there's no explicit message passing yet. However, you can still, in principle, write useful programs, so a task farm. So if there's no communication involved, you could currently launch um, your jobs and fork that code based on the different um, ranks. So it would actually you know, be possible to do something useful. Um, compilation and launching of parallel jobs is not specified by the MPI standard. Um, these are implementation details. Uh, we'll start talking about how to actually run this stuff um, for this course. So the first sort of uh, practical uh, situations where you might need to use the FL8 wrapper instead of F90 um, are any time that you need to use um, Fortran 2008 functionality um, and therefore need to compile with the F2008 compiler. Uh, well, because Sometimes people have legacy Fortran codes. <laughs> I'm not even sure Fortran 90 counts as, as a legacy um, <laughs> at this stage. So uh, if, if your code is Fortran 1990, uh, then uh, use the F90 style. If your code is Fortran 2008, use the Fortran 2008 style. Uh, if you mean in terms of why always provide I error, um, when it's optional in Fortran 2008. Uh, I mean, if your code has to be Fortran 2008 anyway, you make a good point, you don't need to. Uh, you can just omit it. Um, yeah, that's entirely up to you. Um, I would say the only sort of minor difficulty there is if you're in the habit of omitting it, then you suddenly have to write some, for whatever reason, some F90 code, um, you might find yourself uh, having to go back afterwards and throw in a load of uh, IR integers that you've forgotten to put in. Well, that's the only reason off the top of my head um, why that would be important. Uh, Chris Stewart asks, can some processes continue using MPI messages whilst other processes have called finalized? The answer is yes, uh, with the caveat that they cannot communicate with the one that has finalized. Um, so you can envisage a situation where uh, one process had a lot less work to do than all the others. Um, okay, this is bad for load balancing, but if it happens, that's fine. Uh, that process might get to finalize, and as long as it doesn't need to communicate with anything else, you're fine. Um, your code is still correct. The others will continue doing their thing until they too hit finalize, um, and that's all okay. You're only really in trouble if you try and communicate um, with a process that was finalized, because Everything else, it then presumably won't be ready to receive. Um, or indeed, if your other processes are expecting a message, um, it will never be sent because send hasn't been called on that process, presumably if you've reached finalize and it's in the correct place. But there's nothing to stop um, individual processes from doing their thing uh, if there's no communication involved and finishing. Um, so thank you for that question as well. 
Um, okay, so I'll talk a little bit about uh, MPI on Cirrus specifically. Um, but I mean also quite generally. Uh, the first thing is in terms of access. So uh, we do have, hopefully you've seen them, some suggestions for how to actually access Cirrus up on the, the training page. Um, however, just to run through them again, on Linux, uh, this is pretty easy. You have SSH, and you can use it. Um, here we're suggesting that you use XY. I'm not sure why both. <laughs> Perhaps an SSH guru can, can answer that one for me. Um, as I understand that you should only need one of those, but uh, either is fine. That will provide you obviously with an X server connection, which lets you use graphical applications. Uh, the reason we're recommending that is so that if you wish, you may use gedit or get it um, in order to modify files. Um, however, it is not strictly necessary. There's no, certainly in, in this week, there's nothing graphical um, involved in the, in the practical. So you're quite welcome just to SSH. Uh, user at cirrus-msc.epcc.ed.ac.uk uh, where user is your username that you've provided already. Um, hopefully if you've already signed up for a service account. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm on it, that's it. That's all you really need to know. Uh, on Mac, it's marginally more complicated uh, because as I found out recently, uh, apparently they don't include an X server by default anymore. Um, just for clarity, an X server is the thing that Linux uses to provide graphical application or provide a graphical interface. Um, uh, so you need to be running one locally in order to get things sent to you from the computer or SSH to you, or from Cirrus in this case. Um, so Mac, you can install a program called Xquartz, which will provide an X server and display any graphics or graphical applications. Um, Windows needs to install an X server program, such as Mobile Xterm. Uh, Mobile Xterm is quite a nice uh, SSH tool in general. We used to recommend Putty. Um, there's still nothing to stop you using Putty and Xming if that's your preference, uh, or indeed just Putty if you don't need the X server. Uh, I will actually be using, so the other option is uh, Windows and Dino does have OpenSSH built in. Um, I will be using that um, through a thing called Conemu, which allows me to set a nice color scheme for my terminal. Um, all these options are completely fine. Um, if you're not sure which, feel free just to follow the, the recommendations on our page. Um, and if you do have any problems connecting to Cirrus, do let us know. Uh, so there is a thing called mpptemplates.tar available that contains some useful files uh, for building and running applications in Cirrus, especially um, it contains example job submission scripts Ah, uh, thank you, Claire. Claire has pointed out that mobile X term also comes if you're a Windows user. Mobile X term comes in a version that is mobile and does not need admin rights to run, which is helpful if you're on a managed desktop. Um, uh, and yeah, it's, I've used it before. It's, it's very nice. Um, uh, Matthew asked what batch system Cirrus uses. It is, I believe, PBS Pro. Um, for those who are familiar, uh, Claire says, yes, it definitely is. It's good. Um, yes, for those who are familiar with batch systems, um, you probably don't need to see MPP templates.tar uh, PBS scripts, although it may be useful as well to check the Cirrus uh, documentation stuff on PBS scripts. Um, now, one feature of Cirrus as well as worth pointing out is that the login nodes are identical to the computational nodes. So you actually don't need, uh, in terms of the hardware, so you don't actually need to submit batch jobs. You can run stuff interactively on the login node, and that's OK. Um, uh, Claire has very helpfully provided a link to the Cirrus documentation, too. Thank you, Claire. Um, yeah, I recommend taking a look through that if you do get stuck, um, as it does have answers to most questions. Um, but yeah, seriously, you can run stuff interactively, and that's OK on the login nodes, as long as it's not huge, please don't try and, you know, take over the entire login node. <laughs> um, again, we will notice. 
but for small things, especially stuff that we're doing here, where you maybe run on sort of four processes, that's completely fine. Um, it has 36 cores, um, and that's no issue. Uh, but there's useful things in MPP templates .tar, um, and there's other crib sheets available on the course web pages. Uh, in terms of setting up your service environment to actually run stuff, uh, you need to load the mod message passing toolkit, MPT, to module load MPT. So this is the way that we manage environments on our machines is through modules. Um, so this simply loads in the correct libraries for MPI, for example. Uh, and also module load Intel compiler 17. Uh, we recommend using the Intel compilers uh, for this course simply because these are the ones that are uh, suggested by HPE and are tested by HPE who make MPT, uh, which is the MPI library being used here. Um, so those things are most likely to work nicely together. Um, and we're not doing anything especially fancy here, so it should all just work fine. Uh, you can add these things to your bash profile if you wish. Uh, you'll notice there, so this graphical text editor, for those who aren't familiar, as I mentioned, gedit is what's being called there. Um, if, you're, if your preference is Vim or Emacs, that's fine. Um, that's entirely up to you. Uh, I will personally be using Vim, sorry for any people who don't like that. Um, it means that I can just share one application with you and you'll be able to see what I'm doing. Um, but whatever text editor you're most comfortable with is fine. Um, yep. Yeah. Uh, now to compile things, so this assumes that you've already loaded MPT and Intel Compiler 17. That's important. You do need to do those things first. Um, you may forget, and that is a good reason to add it to your bash profile. Uh, but you don't have to. You can just remember to do this every time. Um, if you're compiling C code, it's MPI CC. So this is the standard uh, wrapper that MPT provides for C compiles. Uh, by default, it will just use GNU. So these are quirks that are specific to, to Cirrus. Um, by default, even though M uh, HP recommends using Intel compilers with uh, MPT, it still defaults to just using the GNU compilers. So you do need to add dash CC equals ICC in order to tell it to use the Intel compiler. Um, for C++ programmers, um, it's MPI CXX. And again, similarly, you need to say dash CXX equals ICPC in order to tell it to actually use the Intel compilers. For Fortran programmers, uh, it's just MPI F90, um, and you don't need to worry about telling it which compiler, because it will pick up iFort by default rather than GFortran. Um, I don't know why. <laughs> That's just a, a fun quirk of source. Um, there are some provided make files in that MPP templates. Uh, .tar, which again is available from the, the MPI web page. Uh, sorry, training page um, for online MPI. Okay. Okay, and so for running interactively. Um, wouldn't use it for profiling uh, because it's a login node and you know there's lots of people on there all doing exactly the same sort of things and just running stuff. Um, but you can just use MPI run. So MPI run is the launcher uh, dash M4, where four is the number of processes in this case. It can be anything. Um, you probably don't want to go, certainly not more than 36 um, because there are only 36 cores. Um, and possibly not that high if you are just running interactively on the login node. Uh, now, it does say, so it points out here your output might be buffered and you may need to explicitly flush prints to screen. Uh, I was speaking to David the other day and he thinks that's actually, so David Henty, you know, sorry, who um, often runs this course, and um, he thinks that's actually not true anymore. So if you find that there's no output appearing at all, it may be the issue. Um, or indeed, if your program is deadlocked or crashes, that could also cause that. Um, maybe you can always use Control C uh, to kill it if that does happen. Uh, batch jobs. So as mentioned, we have PBS Pro on there. Um, there is a standard batch script that's set up in a slightly fancy way. 
So what you can do is give it the name of your executable. So if your executable is called hello, then you can call your batch script uh, hello.pbs. Um, and if it's in the same directory, it'll pick that up and run um, hello.pbs. Uh, apologies, I've just realized that now I'm interested. Oh, no, we're OK. Nope, I take it back. I thought I was running late there, but it's just the start of the official practical time, so we're still good. Um, so yes, you can make a copy of that and do it that way. Uh, you can also have a look and at the Cirrus docs and use their standard PBS script if you prefer. It depends on how familiar you are with batch systems. Uh, it's entirely up to you. Uh, it may be sitting in a queue for a while, I'll be honest. Uh, Cirrus is often quite busy. Um, however, there is. Uh, I don't think we do have a reservation uh, in this case, so we've more like that about using the reserved queue during lab sessions. But of course, because this is an online course, you're welcome to use any time. Um, but just if you submit a batch job, uh, it may take a little while to run, but you can always check back on it later. Um, yeah, and if you do that, you'll get an output file of the form, um, your batch script name, yeah, your batch script name dot o, and then some identifying number. Uh, you can follow progress using QStat, which is another batch system tool, um, qstat minus u, and then your username is probably the most useful invocation there. You can also um, provide it with your, ah, so uh, a bucks has hit an issue uh, trying to use QSub. Um, so if you go, and in fact, this is at the bottom of this slide, so this is well-timed. Um, so that default uh, batch script was provided has the budget D167 in it, which is our MSC budget. Uh, you're not part of our MSC, so you don't have access to that one, but you can use TC04. So if you open up um, the .pbs uh, file with the text editor of your choice, there is a line on there that will be hash pbs uh, space dash capital A and space, and then it will say D167. You can change that to TC004. Um, and that's just how we keep track of how much time everybody's using um, for accounting purposes. Uh, and we've given you all the budget for this this course, so that's fine. Um, Claire's also given this information in chat, I see. That's good, thank you, Claire. Uh, but do let us know if you have any issues afterwards. Uh, I'll actually be going through how to do all this stuff um, in a minute as well. Uh, yes, okay, so by default, those wrappers are not in your path. You do need to load MPT first. Um, and importantly as well, if you're running interactively, use MPI run. If you're running, if you're submitting a batch job, um, you need to use MPI exec, MPI exec dash MPT um, because. Um, yeah, you need to not load the uh, Intel compilers and you need to specify the Intel compilers for C um, just because. So important note for all the C++ people out there. Um, now, there was once upon a time uh, some attempt at making a C++ uh, MPI interface and it was essentially abandoned. Um, so the C++ interface is not supported. You may occasionally still find remnants of it around, um, but it is not recommended to use them. You should instead just call the C library instead. Again, Claire's providing some more information about the, the budgets. Thank you, Claire. Um, so yeah, C++ is, uh, yeah, it should just use, C users should just use the, the C interface, although you do, of course, still need to use MPI-CXX so that linking happens correctly and compiling happens correctly and all that. Um, you don't need to do, you don't need to wrap your MPI calls in a, um, uh, oh, what is it again? So I forget what the uh, exact syntax is, but there's a thing you often need to do when you're importing a C library into your C++ code. I believe you don't need to do that um, <laughs> for uh, MPI, 
you can just use it as a SQL uh, in its better form, and that's fine. Um, yeah. But yeah, the main point to take away there is that if you see a C plus plus interface for MPI, um, stay away from it, <laughs> uh, as it is not. Yeah, yeah, it's now been removed and is not supported. Ah, yes, thank you, Chris Stewart. X to MC. That is that is uh, the one I was trying to remember. Yes, um, you don't need that, uh, and you don't need to even to include the MPI H. It's it's fine. Um, the MPI standard is available online. Uh, it's very long and probably not that helpful, but it may be of interest. Um, you can also buy a printed copy of the book if that's your thing. Um, and the man pages are available on Sirius. They are also, as you might expect, available on the internet. Um, you can type man MPI function name, and there are a couple of online versions. Um, there is a book. It also talks about MPI a lot that may be useful to you if you're interested in learning more. Okay. And so hopefully you will find the exercise sheet as well, which is again linked from the main training page. Let me just find it myself. Um, but the point for this first practical is uh, simply to really to get everyone on Cirrus and up and running and able to compile and run some very simple code. Um, so what I'll do now is basically just do a live demonstration of this. Hopefully this works. Yes, good question from Chris, uh, which Claire's already answered. Thank you, Claire. What is MPI run in between lessons 36? Because there are only 36 processes on each node, um, also 36 calls on each node on Sirius. So it actually doesn't need to be less than that, but it should be, because um, it's much better to have no more than one process per call. Uh, so. Uh, I'm going to begin. Right, um, so there's some questions coming up about how multi-node stuff works. Um, I believe that so the point is for MPI run, which is just on a login node, uh, you probably should be doing multi-node stuff. Uh, yeah, so Marta has, has pointed us out and has it right. It's because it's on the login node. Uh, on for a batch submitted job, you're more than welcome to run on multiple nodes, um, just not on the login node. Um, and Chris has asked, um, yeah, the, the same thing essentially. So yes, the point is just on the login node, um, it's limited to 36 because it's a single node, but um, if you submit a batch job, that can be across many nodes and that's fine. Um, uh, Matthew also makes the point that um, one process per CPU is a better approach, certainly, in, uh, on a single node. Um, okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. I've connected. I imagine you're all far ahead of me at this point. Um, did I put anything here yet? No. So if you're wondering how to get uh, stuff onto um, Cirrus easily, uh, there is an answer. So say, for example, that what you want is a copy of mpp.templates.tar. What you can do is go to the website, um, copy the link, okay, and then do wget. Hopefully this works. Uh, and then paste into your terminal. Now, how you paste does differ. <laughs> depending on what you're using. Um, I've done a right click there to achieve that paste. Shift and insert is a popular one for Windows command shells. Mobrex term. Uh, so Mobrex term actually I think lets you do a drag and drop copy across. Um, just like any file browser, you will have to download the file to your um, own computer first. Uh, however, one easy way to do it is once you're on source to use wget to simply Pull the file right there. Um, as you can see, there it is. And if we do tar minus um, xf, okay, so we have a look what's in there. As you can see, there is um, some example world scripts and some example batch scripts and some make files. Um, so, what I will do is I will just 
put out the C example first of all. Oh. Okay, we'll have a quick look at what this looks like. Okay, um, so as you can see, there's standard input output, standard lib. So these are just very standard libraries. This one handles and includes the print function. Standard lib, I think, is actually not strictly necessary here, um, but it's there anyway. And then this is the important one include mpi.h. So you do need this. Uh, so Chris is asking which uh, in the MPP templates.tar is C and which is C. Uh, Hello.c is the C one. Uh, let me just quickly check for you. And .cc is C. <laughs> and Claire has pointed out that um, to begin with, it's best just to run some interactive jobs. And once you're sure your code is, is doing what you want, then you can try submitting as a batch job um, uh, across multi nodes. However, it may take a while to run. So you may come back tomorrow and discover that the whole thing has just failed immediately as it began. Um, and it is very annoying. Yes. <laughs> OK, so. Uh, uh, and yes, uh, Samantha is asking if about using MPI exec dash underscore MPT in the PBS script. Yes, basically what it is is that the um, comp compute nodes uh, don't use MPI run. <laughs> so MPI exec underscore MPT is simply the equivalent for the compute nodes as opposed to the login node. Ah, okay, sorry, <laughs> apologies, Martha. <laughs> um, but thank you for pointing that out then. Um, that is helpful. See, I don't need to do anything. You guys can, can sort it all out. Um, this is great. So we have here a fairly standard Hello World type uh, program. Uh, it's not bothering our C and RV, it doesn't need them, so we're supplying null and null to the init. Uh, it prints Hello World and it finalizes. Um, and so generally the compiler will work out that if you don't return anything in your main, um, that's the same as returning zero. I like to be explicit, so I'm going to add them back in. <laughs> but you don't need to do that. OK, and what I have forgotten to do, you might have noticed, is load the modules. So let's do that. Module load MPT and module load Intel compilers 17. You can tab or to complete those, um, but it does usually take a while. So it's better just to you know, type them in. Yeah, top tip there. Um, and then we compile using MPI CC. CC equals ICC. So this is telling MPI CC to please use the Intel compilers that we've just bothered to load. Um, thank you very much. I'll say minus O hello. So it says uh, create a binary called hello from hello.c. <sighs> what have I done? And I've missed it. <clears throat> there we go, you saw nothing. Uh, okay, so we have a, oh, we can't run hello uh, by itself because it does need at least one process to be launched for it. But we can do that, and it will run as if it were a serial program. Um, so it is definitely possible to write uh, MPI programs that will not run on a single process. Um, it is much nicer, if you can, to make your MPI programs independent of the number of processes. Now, it's simply not always possible, but um, as much as possible, it's always best to avoid a situation where you write a code that w w requires a specific number of processes to run. Um, but that's a sort of bit of general advice. So now let's try this across four processes. And as you can see, we've had Hello World printed four times. Um, OK. So let's try this again with the, uh, let's go with the C++ code quickly first. Mm, I'm doing. Oh, let's see, see there. 
Okay, so let's have a quick look at this hello.cc. Um, okay, so here we're including IO stream instead of standard IO, uh, and it's still NPR to H. I believe that could be in angle brackets, so it doesn't need to be, but anyway, it doesn't really matter. Um, using namespace standard, uh, which brings things like C out up to the main namespace. Um, and again, yeah, it doesn't really need this, but I like it, so we'll put that in. <laughs> but I mean, also, this makes the point that um, finalize doesn't need to be the last thing in your code, and that's okay. Um, okay, and in fact, let's modify this slightly. Let's say int a equals three. Um, and just add that in. Okay. Okay, and this time we need to do MPI CXX dash CXX equals ICPC um, hello.cc. Hello. Okay, uh, and another thing that's sort of interesting to just look at quickly. So if I do that, you can see that by default it's G. Um, just to sort of make this point again. And really, the main point here is just to show you that it is just the standard uh, compiler underneath. Um, so now, if I do MPI run, uh, okay, and so I realized that in the notes it's supposed to use n, that uh, np does exactly the same thing. Um, okay, uh, and as you can see, they've all got the same copy of a. Um, not the same copy of A, they've all got their own independent copy of A, but they're all initialized with the same value. Um, and again, we just get four copies of that same code running. Um, so far, so good. Okay, and let's try this with the F90. Hope you're all ready for a good chuckle here because um, I'm more of a C person than uh, a Fortran person. <laughs> okay, but I think I can get the hang of this one. Uh, so here is the equivalent of our includes in C and C++. Uh, implicit none, as I recall, is always a good thing to do because it stops Fortran from making some assumptions about what you're trying to do. Uh, and this code will just do the same thing as all our other ones. Um, Note the supply of IR here. So in our C codes, we didn't bother collecting that return function. Uh, so Abots is asking, how does check programmatically uh, if you're running on a single process? Um, ah, I see. So you could check uh, MPI com size. That would tell you the total number of processes that have been launched. Um, and then MPI com rank uh, will still work, and it will tell you that you are ranked zero. Um, on a single process, or if a single process has been launched, that will always be zero, which is why I suggested earlier, if you have to have a, a particular special process, it's best to choose zero because that one is guaranteed to exist in all um, in all situations. MPI F90. Uh, Okay, and I successfully compiled around some very simple Fortran code that I didn't have to write, me. Um, <laughs> but okay, that's uh, all that we really want from this, this first week. Um, it's just for people to get um, set up on Cirrus and comfortable with the idea of, of launching and running an MPI job. Feel free to experiment with um, batch scripts as well and submit a larger job across a few nodes. Um, you might, if you're feeling like uh, extending yourself a little bit as well, uh, you might like to have it print out 
Um, and in fact, I think this is what, yeah, so if you look at the exercise sheet, this is what it asks you to do, is actually to have it print out which rank it is as well. Um, I won't go through that just now. I'll, I'll leave that as an exercise, but I will go through it at the start of next week's session. Um, the, uh, yes, so Abbots is asking uh, again uh, more on running on a single process. So if your code might use MPI to run uh, on more than one process, then it still needs all of the, the MPI stuff in it, uh, including it needs to MPI in it and MPI finalize uh, and needs to be launched with a MPI launcher such as MPI exec or MPI run. Um, but you just, so I'll just demonstrate again here. Uh, you just do it in one as your number of processes to launch, and it is effectively running in serial. Um, you can uh, you can use debuggers on MPI code. Um, so you can use the things like GDB, for example. Uh, it is more difficult because there may be multiple processes um, that you need to attach to GDB. Uh, GDB. You can also run things like Valgrind. Um, to detect memory area, memory errors in your MPI code. Uh, there are also specific MPI debuggers available, um, which will tell you more about the communications themselves. So, uh, yes, there are special debuggers, but you can also just use standard ones. However, um, the standard ones will have some difficulties. They won't be able to tell you much about what the communications are doing. They will just see multiple processes running. Um, but there's nothing to stop you um, attaching uh, MPI processes to debuggers such as GDB. Um, but it is true that it is a little bit trickier uh, to debug than a serial code. Um, to the extent you may well resort to print statements, which include rank. <laughs> um, well, that's a good thing or a bad thing is, is a matter of opinion, but uh, that is often a useful approach. Um, so I realize in the end I have managed to run uh, slightly over time here, so apologies for that. Um, but hopefully uh, that was useful just to run through um, getting things running on Cirrus for you. Um, Feel free to email me if you do have any questions. Um, but for now, I'll, I'll leave you to it. Let you go back to your, to your lives. Uh, thank you very much for attending. Hopefully you found it useful today. Um, and I will see you this time next week. Okay, thank you very much, Claire. And thank you, everyone else.